Now, in one segment, I talked a little bit about uh, the psychologist Howard Gardner and his book, Multiple Intelligences, and I kind of uh, basically tied that into how I think many, many elite level hitters really go about learning how to swing. It's, it's not uh, a result of instruction so much as it's practicing a lot and getting a lot out of what they're practicing because they have a very, kind of, as I said, a higher order of kind of kinesthetic awareness of what their body's doing in time and space. And that's a somewhat of a, you know, a somewhat of a genetic argument. Now, countering that to some extent would be uh, research by a guy named Anders Ericsson. I forget if he's professor at Florida, Florida State. Anyway, he spent most of his academic life, some 30 years, kind of trying to answer the question, um, who's successful and why are they successful? So he's written numerous books uh, in, in the last, uh, uh, certainly the last decade or so, and he's the person that kind of made uh, this notion of the kind of 10,000 hour rule uh, somewhat popular, a, a popular kind of uh, idea of what I mean by popular, been popularized by a number of, of people. Malcolm Gladwell, the writer, um, has written about the 10,000 hour rule. Books like The Talent Code, Talent is Overrated, there's a book called Bounce. Uh, and they're using ideas that come certainly uh, from Anders Ericsson's uh, research. And specifically, he has this concept, not a 10,000 hour rule, and this concept of uh, deliberative practice. And what, what, what does that mean exactly? Well, basically, he's making the argument that if you do something long enough and well enough, uh, you're probably going to get pretty good at it. Uh, this does seem all that uh, of a, a far fetched notion or irrational thought. Uh, simply put, if somebody is focused a good deal of time on some subject matter or something that they get interested in, they're probably going to be pretty good. But, but he makes a more refined argument in the sense this notion of deliberative practice, wherein you have two groups, let's say both are, are studying for 100 hours each. But over time, the, the one, one of the groups becomes better. Why is that? Because their practice is much more focused, and that's what he means by deliberative. Now, I won't go into the details of what focus, focus, greater focus, greater refinement, greater pay, pay, paying attention to details. There's any number of ways to kind of think about this uh, in terms of what is deliberative practice. But so it, the argument is, yes, they practice a lot, but they also practice in very, very specific kinds of ways that really helps them uh, master the subject matter. In the context of, of teaching uh, people how to swing back, uh, I'm very much uh, an advocate of this notion of deliberative practice. I was engaged in that kind of thing before I really knew what deliberative practice was. It was, you know, after I'd been a hitting instructor for numerous, for uh, five or six years, I kind of, I think, first ran across this, this research. Uh, in terms of how I teach, what I teach, methods, concepts, ideas, uh, a lot of it is based on really very, very specific kinds of focus on particular aspects of, uh, of the swing, particular aspects of, uh, uh, let's say, flawed movement. Uh, the drills that I do are, are, are very, uh, very, uh, how can I say it best? They're very well thought out. And they, they come with the idea that you can't just go out and swing the bat and hope to get better. It has to be much more refined than that. Uh, years ago, I asked a guy, I was watching the cage, and I said, uh, what are you working on? He goes, uh, well, I'm, uh, kind of, I'm working on my swing. And I, I, you know, I saw the hitter with numerous flaws, and so I was basically trying to get beyond that. So, was there any particular aspects of something you're working on? Uh, no, I'm just working on this point. Well, he has numerous flaws, and what he was telling me is he doesn't really have an idea of what those flaws are, and he doesn't really then have an idea of how to go about 
how about correcting them? He may, if he has a pretty refined kinesthetic awareness, over time he may figure it out intuitively, instinctively, subconsciously, but about 99% of the hitters that I see, they're not going to figure it out. They have flaws. They don't know what the flaws are. They don't know how to correct them. So what I'm going to do is come in and make them do very, very specific things, force them into a kind of a, a modality of practice that's, uh, that is, relatively speaking, much more focused than what they're normally used to doing. Obviously, some people are not going to like that too much, but the trick, from an instructor standpoint, is to get them to understand the relevance of why they need to do this, and over time, uh, with the right kind of application, the right kind of uh, instruction, let's say from me or from guys that kind of know my stuff pretty well, they will improve. They'll start to understand the relevance of it. But it all starts with a, with a notion that practice has to be much more focused, deliberative, if you will, than what they're, norm, the, the, more, what they're used to. Okay? So, just wanted to bring this up as a, another kind of a bit of insight into how I go about teaching and why I teach what I do.